in the audience and I'd like for if you would please come up to our microphone over here and give us your name and the badge you're working on and your troop number. And we have trinkets for them. Mm -hmm. Mark's got them. All right. Uh, my name is Alexander Peters. I'm from Troop 444, uh, along with him. Um, we're working on the Communications Mayor Badge. One of the requirements is we have to go to a government meeting and basically describe two points of view um, and compare and contrast them. Okay, thank you. Um, um, just like what he said, but my name is Max, so... Well, we appreciate badge. you all coming tonight. Welcome. We're going to see government in action tonight. And we have... Uh, Mark, did you already give him the? Yes, okay. I did. We have a, a pin that we always give out to scouts who come to our meetings, and we appreciate them coming. Uh, I'm going to start out with a citizens' forum tonight. Do we have anybody in the audience who has any questions or comments that are not related to anything on the agenda? Uh, we'll move along to the approval of the agenda. Do we have any changes to the uh, agenda, Mark? Uh, no, we do not. Do I have a move for approval? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Approval of the minutes of the June 16th, 2016 meeting. Do we have any changes or comments on that? I do have a comment. On page four, yeah. uh, second from the bottom, a motion was made, but there's no second. And no outcome. What? And no outcome of the vote. <laughs> right. Page four. Which one so was it? So, did it die? What, what section was that again? Page four. Page four. Then next to the bottom. You see it? No mark. Oh, I see. Yeah. Okay. I got you. Yep. Yep, that's a good catch. Sorry about that. We'll get that corrected. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Do I have a motion? Move for approval as amended. Second. I second it. With the with the amendment. All those in Can favor we? say aye. Aye. Opposed? I abstain. I was not at the meeting. Do we have any more abstentions to that to this meeting? Annette. Annette oh, was. Annette, did you want to? Uh, yeah, you weren't there. I wasn't here either, so I need to abstain. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> These months are a blur. Sorry. Election of officers. Um, every year we have um, election of the. Uh, members of the from the members of the Planning Commission for chairman vice chairman and secretary um, do we have any um, questions or comments on that before we make a motion no. then um, I'll, I'll nominate Rita Hall today for uh, chairman I'll second and Ed St. Clair for, oh, we got to vote on that. <laughs> one at a time here. One at a time. One at a time. Okay, Chairman, me, do we have any questions or comments? Have a motion? Yeah. Okay, second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, and I'll nominate Ed St. Clair as the vice chairman. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Abstain. I'll nominate Ed Whiting as secretary. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 So we're all set for next for the next year election of officers. We also at this time approve the uh, Fairgate Municipal Planning Commission bylaws. Uh, any changes in, with any of this, Mark? No, they're. There were last year as we uh, amended the bylaws to provide for the non-voting youth member, but there haven't been any other changes. Move for approval. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Tonight we have um, something that's a little bit different than what we have normally had. We have an appointment of a non-voting youth member. And, Mayor, you have some comments? Yeah. Uh, 
For those who don't know what this is all about, let me explain. Uh, for a number of years now, we've been going to League of Cities meetings and, and other kinds of meetings. And, and uh, when, you, when you go to those meetings, you expect to see a lot of old people like me. Uh, but uh, it turns out that there are a lot of young people involved in those um, meetings. And they are doing uh, internships or whatever uh, in cities. And it's a good way to uh, have young people who might be interested in uh, government uh, work. Uh, gives them an exposure that they otherwise would not have had. And um, it's a lot of cities that are doing that. And, and I thought it was a good idea for us to try to do the same thing because um, I, I know we have uh, a number of end, uh, young people who are interested in knowing more uh, uh, about government and how it works. So, uh, Jack, stand up. Jack Coker, that's a famous name in this area. He is our uh, victim <laughs> <laughs> for, for this particular uh, committee. Now we're doing this for the other committees too, but uh, we're glad to have you and um, don't be shy. <laughs> and by the way, we don't let him vote. <laughs> he's a non-voting member of the Planning Commission if he's um, elected here. Uh, Jack is a resident of the town of Farragut and he's a homeschool. He's interested in planning and uh, has a special interest in pursuing uh, a degree in civil engineering so his interests really fit in with the Planning Commission and um, so do I have a motion? Well can I just make one comment or suggestion? Um, I know that um, Mark Shipley well most of our staff is pretty swamped so if um, any of us and I've offered my um, time to help him through some of the agendas so that it doesn't all fall on Mark I think that would probably be a, a good idea um, and he'll get it a chance to get to know some of us and understand our backgrounds where, as we're, we're working through the process. And so it doesn't all fall on Mark's lap. So and, that's my and suggestion. And for sure we will, we will provide him with training just like we do all members of the Planning Commission. And, and also at the time, too, we do have um, training provided by outside agencies uh, and that I'm sure Jack would find interesting. Um, there's one coming up before too long about um, stormwater, which I think would be something you'd be very interested in from having talked to you. So um, the walking one will be interesting too. too. Yeah. Right. So uh, you'll be on the email list just like the rest of us to get notification of, of those. So, but do I have a motion? So moved. A second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you, Jack, and you're welcome to, I think we have a seat already planned over here for you. Do you have anything to, you have anything to say, Jack? Oh, yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hello, I'm Jack Coker. I just wanted to thank the board for giving me this opportunity to, um, to serve the community in this way, and I thank you for the opportunity to just uh, grow in knowledge and wisdom about um, the, how planning and, and how the community works. And it's just such an amazing opportunity, and um, I hope I can fulfill the expectations. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jack. You're here. That pretty much fulfills our expectations. <laughs> <laughs> I may get Jack to help me proof my minutes next time. <laughs> well, your, your interest in, um, is very much in, in the line of what, what we're doing, and I know you have a love of this community, and so... We welcome your input. Okay, item number seven, discussion and public hearing on the final plat for Sheffield Subdivision, Unit 3. Located off Turkey Creek Road, parcel 52.04, tax map 152, zoned R-1 OSR, 50 lots, 27.36 acres, David Fisher, applicant. Uh, this 
that uh, project actually back in August of 2015 the preliminary plat was approved uh, through the Planning Commission for phase three um, as you mentioned it's uh, 50 lots 48 house lots two open space lots um, this would finish out this will finish out the Sheffield subdivision uh, off of Turkey Creek Road um, there will be a uh, there's been constructed actually in the field a walk and trail connection um, and uh, to Turkey Creek Woods and I can show you that it's basically basically in that area so that'll give um, you know a nice pedestrian link between Turkey Creek Woods, Kingsgate, Audubon Hills uh, and Sheffield you know and our walk and trail larger walk and trail network to both the east and the west um, the uh, remaining comments uh, are at your places um, there I think all and they actually submitted a revised plat I just haven't had a chance to look at it but um, most of the comments although there's quite a few they're pretty much all should be easy to address um, we're still waiting on a determination on whether uh, lot 59 is has a sinkhole or not which could affect lot 60 and that's in this general area here but uh, the staff would not hold up action on this plat for that if if they needed to they could always do a plat of correction involving those two lots through the through the staff um, so um, they're waiting to hear back from TDEC on the uh, assessment of whether or not that is a sinkhole so with the uh, subject twos at your places the staff would recommend approval of this final plat Will you give us your name and, and address please yes my name is Ryan Lynch and it's 5109 Catalina Road, Knoxville, Tennessee, 37918. And I'm here for the applicant, and I'm also the surveyor. And we appreciate your time, and we have worked with the staff, and we have gone over the comments, and we ask that you would approve based on those comments. And you're fine with their list here? Absolutely, we are. Uh, when, when did this subdivision start? Originally with Phase 1, I think it was 2007. That sound about right? Uh, yeah, I don't remember. It's been been a while. Oh. Yeah. It's a different developer actually too. Okay. Back then. Mm -hmm. Well we um it's a nice looking nice looking area. And um, um so you all are okay with all this? So yes, we are. So we ask that you would approve based on those comments and we are gonna work with the staff and, and make sure the rest of them are taken care of. Uh, any questions or comments? I have a um, question. It's um, number seven says area calculations list 49 rather than 48 house lots. Is that assuming that um, lot 60 is buildable? Is that going to change the? Obviously, it's going to change the lot numbers if um, it's not buildable. That is correct, and and there is some uh, difference there because of that. We we didn't know which way we were going to go, but we're going to go with what Mark has said now and and basically just wait on the determination and then if we need to we will uh, do a plat of correction and, and fix that table okay. now mark there was um, this is a different sinkhole area than what we had talked about before wasn't there another sinkhole in this there there are a few sinkholes in Sheffield but this is the only one in phase three okay and what about um, 13? Are property owners being made aware of the FUD stamp and that is being added to the plats? Do they are they being being made aware of? Uh, I assume that's added to each property. It's something that First Utility District puts on their plats. Um, it's an, a recorded body of restrictions, I guess, uh, for lack of a better way of phrasing it, that uh, deals with activities that may occur within their easements okay like planting certain species of trees and those kinds of things um, would be discouraged in a sanitary sewer easement for example does that end up in your covenants or is that something that ends up where it in, impacts a certain uh, lot the homeowner will be 
it, informed of? Yeah, it's on the plat. Okay. So it, it's a bold statement there that, you know, it's subject to the first utility covenants recorded at. Yeah. Then uh, we have a note on there about how the existing or the proposed water and sewer that just got installed also has easements, which would direct them to that same note. So okay. they, they are made aware if they buy the lot, then they're buying it based off of the information on the plat, and it's, it's right there for them to see. Okay. Because I have to say, when I bought my house, I did not look at my plat, so I don't know if I have <laughs> restrictions. For, boy, if I do, and I have a swimming pool over them. It's a good reason to hire a surveyor before you, you buy a house. <laughs> Is that how you, to, when these things are on there, that's how you find out? Yes, exactly. Okay. All right. That, that was going to be one of my questions, too, is how down the two or three owners down the road, how do you find this out if you go to purchase this house? Uh, obviously, when you buy p property, you know, not speaking out of term, but when you go through real estate and then you close, all of those documents trail with that deed. And if you buy a lot X in a subdivision, it's part of record. And really, it is the buyer's responsibility to make sure they get information from the realtor or they hire a surveyor to make sure that their property lines and things are shown. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. Mark, is there still any, uh, I think, disagreement or, or contention relative to, I noticed in comments 11 and 18 the response um, that they were quoting from Rackley engineering is that is that kind of history now and we're just waiting on TDEC my understanding they're just waiting on TDEC uh, for a determination on that we turned that into them over 10 weeks ago because if you remember we were going to put in a partial for this then we didn't have the grass in the in the situation we needed it so we've been waiting ever since almost Two and a half months ago to hear from them we still haven't heard i think there's been some some uh, manpower change out up there and it's slowing down a little bit they only have a couple people to cover the whole state so i mean it's mm -hmm. my comments you know, understand but my comments more pointed toward is there some professional that, disagreement from rackley about really the i'll say the jurisdictional requirement and tdec versus the town and is that still ongoing or is it uh, is well we always back? get we always defer to tdec as the official determination okay. on these matters That's so important to hear that that sinkhole was shown as is shown in the u.s geographic topo map as a closed depression so we have marked it as a sinkhole unless proven otherwise and that final determination has to be has to come from a town sinkhole ordinance it has to come from tdec and so as, as, as we've been working back and forth, Mark eloquently worded the, the number, I think it's number one or two response to it, and, and we are aware of it. You know, everybody's going to be aware of it. You're aware of it now. So we're just going to work through it and make sure that all the people that need to be notified and dealt with are appropriately. Um, Mark, originally, um, I, I guess we were, we were, when we were discussing this, you guys were thinking about maybe conditioning it to just um, eight lots to begin with. Have we moved beyond that, and now it's just we're looking at um, plat approval without? Uh, we're looking at just plat approval tonight. The town has the authority to to issue as many building permits or withhold as many as okay. they feel is necessary. Okay. What we're trying to do is work with the developer on letting them get started, but we also have some field items that they're aware of yeah. and that they need to continue to work on, which I fully expect that they will. Um, and if they don't, then we'll simply hold up building okay. permits or okay. inspections if we have to. Uh, and they, they're aware of that. All right. More questions or comments or anyone in the audience having questions or comments? Have a, a motion for approval the final plat Sheffield subdivision unit three subject to numbers one through 16. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Good Thank luck. you. Item number eight discussion in public hearing on the resubdivision of lots 50, 50, 51, and 61. Uh, the battery at Berkeley Park, located on the western side of Cotton Blossom Road, parcels 50, 51, and 61. Tax map 142A, Group D, zoned R-1, OSR, three lots, 1.366 acres, Benchmark Associates, Incorporated Applicant. Uh, this is a uh, pretty minor resubdivision of two vacant house lots uh, in the battery at Berkeley Park. Um, 
the purpose of this is just to expand the building envelope slightly uh, for lots 50 and 51. Uh, as part of that undertaking, they would be uh, taking part of an open space lot that surrounds those lots. Um, they're removing about 665 square feet of the open space lot, which is this lot. Um, the two house lots in question are those. Um, they, uh, in the subdivision, this is an OSR development, so it's required to have 35% open space. Um, they're in excess of what the requirements are in terms of open space. They still have, even after this resubdivision plat, over 1,500 square feet of excess open space. So. Um, in the case of this plat, they're not creating a violation in that regard, uh, and the staff would recommend approval of the plat as submitted. I'm, ben you are. I'm Benny Mormon with Benchmark Associates, 10308 Hardin Valley Road, and uh, as always, we've enjoyed working with staff and hoping to get your approval. Does anybody have any questions or comments? I move for approval. I'll second. All favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Thank you. Item number nine. Discussion and public hearing on a site plan for Autumn Care 3 Assisted Living Parcel 11117 Tax Map 142 Zoned S-1 located at 400 Heron Road 4.68 acres, Autumn Care 3, LLC, Peter Falk, applicant. Um, <clears throat> let me first of all state that we'll have to take two actions on this item. The first would be dealing with the access, the proposed access onto Heron Road, um, similar to the premier eye care site plan that we looked at last month. We'll, um, this access is uh, closer than what's permitted in the uh, uh, access ordinance of the town. Uh, they're required to be 200 feet from the intersection. Uh, Heron Road is a collector street, um, and uh, they, are, they would be, per the traffic impact study, they would be 110 feet from the stop bar that's on Heron Road just to the uh, north of Campbell Station Road. Uh, so they would be... First, we would do that you, first. You would need to take action on the variance uh, first. I mean, once you all properly discuss the access. Okay. Um, but just to give you a little bit of overview uh, of the project, I think everybody on the commission is certainly familiar with the, the property and the project. Um, but uh, we, a few months ago, we amended the the uh, community service zoning district to provide for some new provisions that would make it more flexible, um, add some uses to the community service district and make it more consistent with the civic institutional land use that's in our land use plan. And uh, as part of that effort, we added some uses that we felt like were, I guess, quasi-institutional that have comparatively low traffic impact um, and uh, one of those uses is assisted care living facilities um, so uh, whenever uh, the uh, s1 amendments were adopted this property was requested for rezoning from r2 to s1 um, there was also an amendment to the future land use map from very low density residential to civic institutional um, at this point, they're requesting site plan approval uh, for the facility uh, there on the screen. Again, as I mentioned earlier, the proposed access would be off of Heron Road, which is a collector street. Uh, there would be a deceleration lane as you come in off of Campbell Station Road. It's not a very far distance, but um, there would be one here as you come in so that it's somebody going, you know, north west on Heron Road is gets out of the flow of traffic. Um, you know, somebody that's going into the assisted living facility is gets out of the flow of traffic. Uh, 
as you're going into that facility. Um, there would be a stormwater detention area and bioswale. Um, there's a bioswale area, I think, in here and somewhere down in here. There's a detention basin area. Uh, I believe it's in this general area. Um, a couple other things when we get to the site plan that we probably need to discuss just because of the transition concept that we looked at when we were amending the S1 uh, would be a proposed dog park that they show for the residents uh, and that's located there. And then um, a fire truck turnaround apparatus road uh, in that location. Um, and we'll talk about those when we get to the site plan, but the first item to be uh, considered would be the uh, proposed access onto Heron Road. They would need about a 90-foot variance. Um, the traffic impact study was prepared by Cannon and Cannon, and where they're showing the access on Heron is where uh, the traffic engineer recommended. Uh, initially, they looked at moving it further up Heron Road, um, but the site distance because of the curve uh, through here uh, created some issues. So that's why they moved it down and that placed it in violation of the 200 foot distance that's required between intersections and access points uh, on a collector street. So with that, I'll turn it over to any questions or comments from you all. And I do have one person that has signed up to speak okay. on this matter. The applicant have something he wishes to say. Tell us who you are and then. Uh, Peter Falk, uh, 9122 Links View Drive, Knoxville, Tennessee. Uh, the traffic study, the recommendation, uh, I think one point that I would like to make about that is that no matter what was developed on that property, that has to be where the driveway is. There's no other option unless you wanted to discuss Campbell Station Road and that was rejected. That was my question is uh, why did we not consider an entrance from Campbell Station Road? And, um, Noah, do you have any, any thoughts on that? Well, I mean, I think generally speaking, we, we try to send somebody over to a signalized intersection when we can. Okay. And I think that, that was, um, and to reduce curb cuts. Uh, obviously, if, if their traffic was such that, they, that the second entrance was critical for life or safety that we could revisit, but I'm, I don't think it's critical for life or safety in this particular scenario, and that's a heck of a topographical bank to try to uh, grade and get up and down. So did that answer your question, I, Louise? I but I so. think generally that, that's kind of what we had felt when we started looking at this a while back, is that we, we want that traffic to be able to have access and pri primarily use that signalized intersection. I think what uh, frustrates me is it just, it, it seems so close to the intersection. And I understand that they had to place it there because of of uh, the curb. And um, my concern is that there'll be stacking issues. And um, I'm just, that con that location concerns me, I guess. But. Hello, I'm Steve Young with Odell Young Architects. I live at 6902 Burt Newman Lane, 37921. Um, the, the traffic port, uh, they looked at the stacking issue and the amount of distance that we have, uh, that there was uh, less stacking than the amount of pull-off that we have. So they, they determined that the best location for the entrance to the site was the middle of the site where we put it. Okay, so when they do their traffic study, because I don't really understand all the signs of that, they put out their counts throughout the day yeah. over a certain period of time. Mm -hmm. is it Was it during the school year? Do you know? I, I don't know. But, uh, that that can impact whether well, how much traffic you have at a certain time of day. Um, I think they looked at it at different times. Okay. They, they looked at peak, yeah, I, I remember now, they looked yeah. at peak times and, uh, and that's where the worst case scenarios were. Okay. I'm sorry, again, and we conceded the desale lane uh, to address that as well. I think his actual study was with just the two lanes, so the desale lane also in, actually improved his original okay. thoughts. So, I mean, the de yeah, that's that's a that's a pretty big consideration on our on our part for the site. He's is more concerned with more of the egress than ingress. Yeah, and so and, and 
I have to agree. I don't think there's a perfect solution. If you're trying to get out of there at 7.30 in the morning and you've got a couple of neighborhoods also trying to take their kids to school at 7.30, I mean, it's going to be a little tough to get out of there. I think with um, with scheduling of your employees and shift changes, I'm not necessarily worried about your customers all trying to have a mass exodus at one time like a movie theater. Uh <laughs> But your shift changes would be the one that could exacerbate that, and that might be something you guys may really want to think about is uh, is that morning egress at about probably about 7.15 to 8 o'clock. Yeah. And uh, that's what I was going to suggest, w w Jeff. One advantage for that is that that would be our night shift, and that's our least staff shift requirement. Uh, for our facility, that would probably be four people. Okay. Does that shift okay. get off? Uh, 7 a.m. Okay. Well, I mean, it. It probably threw yeah. out by 7.15, yeah. you're okay. Yeah, but yeah, yeah. If you, yeah. You just and that was also in his study was that the traffic that was generated was off peak hours. We do 12-hour shifts, 7A to 7P. Right. So all the traffic for us other than visitors, and they do not come at breakfast at 8 o'clock because that's not a good visitation time because it's meal time, and they don't come at 5 o'clock because that's dinner time. So pretty much our traffic is non-peak traffic. Sense. That was my most, and, and most of that is it's not um, it, your morning time is going to be your issue, and you know, mm -hmm. probably aware of that. Yes. So, okay. Oh, I do have a question. I'm sure I've read this and you said it. How many um, people do you expect to have in your facility? How many residents? Uh, that ended up the final uh, construction was 68 apartments. Okay. So, in some apartments, more than one person can live? Uh, if it's a husband and wife, uh, they would share an apartment. That is possible, but not very many, not a high percentage of them. And we actually uh, anticipate probably uh, industry standards about a 93% occupancy. If you survey across the state, uh, most assisted livings have a 93% occupancy because of the turnover, move-ins, uh, people going to other levels of care. Uh, and so that would even be less than the 68. If, if we stayed full all the time, I would be a very happy owner. So you're going to have a, I see on your plan you have a dog park. Um, clearly that means that you have some of your residents have animals. Uh, I'll let the creator of that speak to that. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, we are a pet-friendly facility. Oh, uh, oh, sorry, I'm Marie Falk. Uh, 9122 Langston Drive, um, 37922. Um, so yes, the, we encourage uh, residents who have had pets to continue to enjoy having pets. And uh, the dog run is, um, to, because a lot of time now in our current facilities, families have to come to really walk the pets because the residents are really no longer able to do that themselves. So having the dog park would give them a little bit more independence in terms of taking care of their dogs uh, because they could go, we could have like a little bench and they can go and take the dog off the leash and sit down and watch their dog play. And that would be just like a great, you know, therapeutic activity for them to enjoy. And even those that can't take care of a dog or have a dog themselves, they can share do their dog with other residents by maybe two or three of them going together and sitting in the dog park and, you know, watching the dogs have fun. And I have a dog that I take to the facility myself to, uh, to let them enjoy. Do you know if uh, the adjoining property owner, Ms. Reeve, is aware of the location of this dog park next to her property? I'm not aware of that. I don't know. I hadn't spoken to her about that. My concern would be, you know, whatever noise and Well, those are, those are usually dogs that are under 10 pounds, and we're not talking about, you know, uh, 10 dogs, probably, you know, one or two or three at All the most. make a lot of noise. Yeah, <laughs> well. <laughs> In fact, they, they tend to make more of a constant noise. <laughs> uh, well, I guess I have a good dog. <laughs> she doesn't. <laughs> well, it's not going to be a good practice to let her know that that, because that location has uh, kind of jumped out at me. It's her location. Her, yeah, she, and, and the other thing. Good, she's been very good in working with you. Yes, also. she has. I'd hate to have a surprise and then. And the other good thing would be that it wouldn't be uh, going out early in the morning or, you know, late in the evening where you wouldn't want to have, you know, you're going to have sleeping hours. And so the dogs wouldn't be out and about at that time. It'd be just, you know, maybe mid-morning or mid-afternoon. 
something related to the dog park is that, as you can see it is within that 50 foot transition area that's one thing i wanted to talk about with the site plan um, the transition area is pretty flexible in what it allows uh, it does allow for like a passive pocket park kind of area whether you could consider a dog park in that regard um, the intent was to have something like a small community park that could be used by surrounding entities not just this property owner but others if they so chose to come and use the the area because again the transition concept in the s1 is we're trying to look at instead of providing for buffer strips that separate and segregate um, abutting uses we're trying to provide for activities and space that actually encourages connections between adjoining properties um, so that's something that needs to be thought about because if if you approve it in this case you you know we'd have to somebody else could propose something similar somewhere else um, that may or may not be as palatable so it's Is it intended to, to be restricted about. just to your your residence use well that was my intent um, and I pretty much had the idea came to me because uh, we just purchased uh, a condo in uh, Florida and uh, which is being built at this time and one of the thing as part of the condo uh, was a dog run and I thought oh that's a cool idea so I wanted to bring that here to the residents on average you said something about just a few dogs how many dogs do you do well you have now? actually right now we don't we've had as many as two dogs at a time right now unfortunately we don't have any dogs the only dogs that they do get are people you know like I bring my dog and we have uh, some other people that will bring you know a dog like for pet therapy the Humane Society brings a dog once a month so we really don't have a great big population I mean that may encourage more people to have dogs if we have you know that dog run so you know we could have you know maybe four or five and your maintenance staff would help with cleanup oh yeah we would be totally responsible for keeping it clean and sanitary you probably have some benches in there I guess and just so if it's not being used as a dog park it could be more purely a functional pocket park a passive park to sit and they will have to provide uh, buffer strip plantings um, where there's not existing vegetation uh, they would have to meet the buffer strip planting requirements of a 35 foot wide buffer uh, so that's something that when we reviewed the landscape plan for this project we one of the comments was to add you know enhance the evergreen plant material along the dog park you know just again to try to help with the noise and potentially the smell or you know that kind of thing from an adjoining property owner but not create a wall or total isolation well if you look at I don't know if the landscape plan reflect uh, the uh, design uh, around that park it's basically going to be completely uh, surrounded by uh, evergreen bushes and even the entry it's like an English IV uh, you're not going to see any kind of structure it's going to be all green and you won't really be able to see into the park when you know all the planting are have reached maturity yeah he'll just need to show that on the landscape plan because we like English Ivy we don't actually allow well, it's that. Not Ivy. it's something else <laughs> sorry so well something I have yeah pictures of it. <laughs> hopefully not poison Ivy yeah. <laughs> It's not ivy. It's it's a oh, it's, it's a poison ivy. Thing. Skip laurels is what you <laughs> have, what you have on the plans. Skip laurel. Yeah, here we go. Right. Yeah, okay. but it's it's shape, you know, like into the entry. It's like a door, and it's all green. I, I think what Mark's referring to is is a screen for your residential neighbor. Yeah. Um, yeah. As much yeah. as a screen you you may want from your residence to look at the dog park, but um, 
right now you've got I may need my magnifying glass here and pull up the landscape. A couple of, maybe a couple of uh, yellow wood and a maple and a couple other things and obviously you've probably got some existing privet and who knows whatever else along that fence line. Um, usually uh, old fence lines end up having kind of natural screening anyway, but maybe those are some things that, that staff... Yeah, just, they'll need to beef that up. Yeah. Okay, work through in, in, with the applicant in the field. And that's doable. It's not a big it's not a big deal. I guess we just need to think about it philosophically. It's a transition area, and we need to kind of what we are going to consider acceptable in transition areas because we're going to have this come up with other projects potentially the one on smith road for example mm -hmm. um, let me ask this if um the neighbor to the north of you is um does not like this idea at all are you uh, amenable to changing the location that that is not my i mean i did not pick the location that's something that the architect and engineer kind of you know decided where to put things so i would have to let them speak <laughs> to that hi um there's not a lot of other, other places to put it actually unless we want to put it in the front yard and i don't think we want to do that uh we've got campbell station side which is we don't want it there. We don't want the front yard in the in the back. We've got we're we're really crowding the uh, the aquatic buffer and the there's a sewer easement back there. And you've, and you've got the bioswales, which are also bioswales. Which we, we don't want you to lose so the bioswales. So that, for us, it's the uh, there's not much of an option, and it's it, for us it really is nice just to fit it into all the trees and make it a shady spot. Uh, for the people utilizing it. How big is that space? Because you say it's a park, but it's really more like a run, right? Mm -hmm. and it's a, it's more it's 20 by 60 plus a, a, a little seating area, and then we have a, a little place for trash cans, you know, to put the dog poop and so forth. And uh, yeah, waste 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 station. Yeah, I need to be politically correct. Mark, didn't we once figure that this room was 70 feet? Is that what we determined the total de depth? All the way to the to the back. So I don't remember. Kind of give it give it perception. You've kind of got a. Yeah, I, don't, I can't remember. You, to be we, I think we counted ceiling tiles one one time to figure. But at any rate, <laughs> kind of give you an idea. So along twelve hundred square feet, twenty by sixty, which I which I think is probably appropriate for a for a dog run. Personally, I can't see a whole lot of people using the dog run at the same time. And to me, if in neighborhoods over the years where we've ever had an issue with a neighbor with a barking dog, it's usually because they leave a dog outside, either tied up or in the backyard without any interaction, and then you get a dog that can bark nonstop. But I just can't see that happening in this situation. I can see a resident or a family member bringing a resident's dog to them. They play with a dog, and then either the dog goes home or the little dog goes back in. I'm sure you're going to have some size requirement. But I just can't... Um, I can't see a lot of noise coming out of this. I'm sure you may have two little chihuahuas that maybe bark at each other at, at a moment in time, but I just can't see it being a persistent noise nuisance. I would just call it something different, really. I'd just call it a, a sitting garden area. And if you just so happen to take your dog in there, yeah, a, then you we, take your dog in there. We'll be glad to call it whatever you like. <laughs> Because really, what I think it, it's also going to serve as just a place for meditation, you know, sitting and just relaxing, you know, uh, and depending on how much the dog barks, it may or may not be that relaxing. You won't, you won't be but, leaving the dogs outside by themselves. No, no. I think that would be better wording for yes. the transition concept because we don't want it. It I, to me, it would be kind of a an, that's an accessory use of that space would be for dogs it'd be primarily just a sitting area an english garden or something you know like that to where you have some some uh, benches in there and people can go in and read a book or whatever they want to do there's some passive activity and and they can also uh, with your facility take their their dog in there if they want to but uh, i would probably just call it something something different that works 
for me. Yeah. I like the idea of enclosed with a entrance arch with greenery. I, I, those are those are nice, and that provides the residents with a outdoor space, but not being viewed. I, I really think it, it really meets the definition of what we talked about with these transition areas, trying to come up with passive recreation and some opportunities for it, and I, I think it's a great fit. I, I know we're, are we still fo we're still focused on the, the driveway entrance and that uh, variance and approval. Is that right? Yeah, we have taken Do we need to get past that? that? Yeah. yeah, we probably ought to talk about that, I guess, unless you all are finished talking about the proposed access, because we will need to take action on that first and then action on the site plan itself. Anybody have any more questions or comments on the access? On the access, okay. We need to include the distance in that variance. Usually we try to say the number of feet, and I can't try to remember what that um, that is. Well, based in, on in the motion, we, we try impact to... study, it would be 90 feet because it's 110 feet. Okay, and we're in 200 minutes. So basically they need a 90-foot variance. Is that right? Yeah, from the stop bar, okay. basically north. There's a stop bar. Well, yeah, that's the oh, big right white. Here. The big, yeah. I'd like to offer a motion for approval of the access variance of 90 feet on Heron Road. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That, that would be for the access as recommended by the traffic impact study. Yes. Right. Okay. Do, I, do I need to amend that motion to include that language? Motion uh, for variance uh, of 90 feet from the required 200 feet, and uh, which will net 110, and also subject to the uh, recommendations of the traffic impact study. Second. All those in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? So we move along to the site plan. I have a couple of questions. It looks like the two drainage or utility easements touch the building in two different places. Is that a problem? Uh, one of them is for water along Campbell Station, and the other is for sewer on the back of the property near, you know, towards the creek. And uh, it's not a problem. We've put our if building you, to miss all of that. Uh, yeah, it abuts it. There's one area where like they the just need to scale back on their overhang. It does overhang. Yeah. A sanitary sewer easement slightly it should be an easy modification. Our building is not on any of the easements no, no, I'm not yeah. saying it's on, on the easement. the easement it looks like it abuts it it comes right next to it uh, now we do we, we our roof overhang was a foot over and uh, so Mark and I talked about that and we're gonna have to move the building a foot uh, so that's just right back. in this area does that water line really meander like that? That's it really what does. I was wondering. <laughs> it really does. <laughs> yeah, there's, three there's a manhole in that angle section. Well, well no, the water, water typically would be like for sanitary that. sewer. I'm just surprised you're, that we're talking domestic water, right? Oh, oh, yes, know, yes. It's just the way it meander. Yeah. I'm just I'm surprised First Utility. Uh, it must have something to do when we rebuilt Campbell Station yeah. Road. First Utility was in a hurry yeah. to put that well, line in. Who, who and so they just went out there and put it in and told the surveyor to do an as-built afterwards. So. They... Uh, <laughs> That that location really restricted where we could put the building quite a bit because yeah. it, it yeah. made us have to work a lot harder. <laughs> yeah. And the other question I have, how high, how high is that wall on Camel Station? Oh, uh, it, it's, um, you know, the, the site slopes down towards the creek, and so, and we talked about this earlier, uh, so it's it's one story about halfway back into the building and then it uh, it it uh, the grade slopes down to two, two stories towards the end of it uh the but i was wondering this looks like a retaining wall i think it's just land i think it's just grass i think it's just oh, represent that's, that's, the, that, that's just sorry. that that, that is bank. the bank uh along campbell station okay that's so just that's the that's just the grass grass wall. bank okay yeah there's no wall there Amazingly, you guys were able to do this with just a handful. Really, I see really just one retaining wall, and that's over by the parking lot. Is that right? Yeah, we that's well, the actually the the edge of the parking lot will have to be a little bit of a retaining wall. I think that's, uh, I think that's uh, phenomenal that you guys were able to do all that and uh, reduce the number of retaining walls. So, well, uh, yeah. 
the, the one that kind of shows the landscaping uh, profiles oh, you with, want the, to show that with the elevations. Uh, we tried to highlight the comments that the staff felt might warrant some discussion. There's 31 remaining comments, which sounds like a lot, but most of them are should be easy to address. Uh, some of them are just reminders, like you know, providing as built and that kind of stuff. Um, but, uh, you have any questions on that? Somebody have a question on this? This is uh, basically what you would see from Campbell Station Road on the top. Um, if you look at the landscape plan, it's pretty heavily landscaped, uh, really all over the project. Um, we can go back. Whoops. Let's see. And this is looking at it from the south end toward the creek. And you can see there's quite a bit of landscaping. Uh, all around the building and then as you go toward the north that continues along there's a lot of uh, building landscaping around the building foundation um, so it's uh, they did a good job with uh, with the landscape plan I think uh, pretty heavily landscape project some of the comments that we had that remain one of them we've already talked about with the sanitary sewer easement um, the dog park we've talked about there is uh, also from the fire marshal recommendation for a uh, fire apparatus truck turnaround and that would be in this area here it also encroaches into the transition area it is proposed to be a grass pave system to where um, grass would come up through um, the uh, structural components. It would look like grass pretty much because um, it wouldn't be used that much. Um, so that was kind of the compromise of allowing that into the transition area. The the plan from a staff's perspective and, and what they would need to do on a plat is go ahead and plat an access easement to this property line so that if uh, conditions change in the future this person moves and they want to sell the property maybe autumn care wants to expand then they would have uh, access that they could have into this property which would get them to a much better access point on heron road to the north um, so in the transition area we do allow for flexibility to have connectivity and this is an example of providing for connectivity when the future conditions may may warrant that i take it mark that type of um, paver can take that kind of heavy equipment that's part of what they have to demonstrate on their plans there is a load bearing that the paver system has to be able to withstand and our fire marshal reviews that Mark, I see some mention to a walking trail and a bridge. Can you can you identify that on the site plan? Yeah, that's plan? another uh, item that um, currently the walking trail from Cottage Creek stubs out to the property line of Autumn Care. And what there's a drainage way through the through the property, kind of in that direction. So <clears throat> when we looked at this, we met with the architect and engineer out there. And originally they were proposing to put the walking trail on the south side of the creek but that was mostly in the aquatic buffer which is not allowed uh, and it also is a heavily tree covered area that provides some buffer for woodland trace in this case so what they're going to need to do is actually have a bridge crossing of the uh, uh, un studied stream area it's not a FEMA stream it's it's an unmapped stream uh, and then at that point uh, the walking trail would would be partly within the sanitary sewer easement partly without and stub out down to Campbell Station Road uh, into the pedestrian facility there um, the crossing of that uh, drainage way um, 
they need to do some engineering study on that um, and they're not quite ready with their plans yet for that component of this uh, development so they'll be coming back before you for the bridge and walk and trail aspect of the site plan probably in September it won't be next month um, there's no reason from a staff's perspective that you couldn't take action on the remainder of the site plan uh, there will be a connection uh, from Cottage Creek to Campbell Station Road it's just a matter of trying to figure out um, you know the best the best way to accomplish that um, and that's what we came up with was just crossing it and having it over on the uh, north side of the drainage area also allows the facility to make use of the walk and trail uh, system as well. Uh, let's see what else we had here. We already talked about the access. Um, one suggestion, and I've talked with the architect about this, is uh, <clears throat> Since this is kind of a um, transitional land use, and that was one of the goals of the S1, is to try to really look at their lighting and instead of using the shoebox and more kind of commercial style fixtures. Now they've got some decorative lighting in the project, but try to expand that throughout the project so it gives it kind of a more residential look and feel. Um, and that would be kind of consistent with the park across the street, um, that kind of thing. Uh, so that was a suggestion. It's not a requirement. Um, and another thing, let's see, I believe that was, that's probably the main, the main items that the staff had as far as looking for additional input from, from you all. Now, I think in conversation with the with the applicant, they're certainly open to looking at more decorative lighting. Um, they something? can speak to that directly. <laughs> uh, I guess I had talked to the architect about uh, having some gas lights instead of some electric lights, because to me that's like a softer, more, you know, neighborhood like look upscale look so i do have uh, a sample of the gas light that i would like to use on the building if you'd like to have that but i guess i was i was hearing that that wasn't something that you guys were really open to and i was wondering why yeah, i'm not really sure um i'd have to look at the fixture there may be a way to do it but in the town our current outdoor site lighting is basically an anti-glare ordinance and uh, if you can actually see the light source from the fixture then you're probably in violation of our ordinance um, now there might be a way I'd be happy to look at that in more depth because I do like that look mm -hmm. uh, like Colonial Williamsburg has that in their downtown area I think it's a real classy look but on the other hand, I can't approve something for you that's not specifically currently provided for. It might be something that we could could work through with a lighting text amendment or something if it's found to not be compliant with the current wording. Because I think we might want to encourage that kind of fixture in our town center area, for example. Uh, it is a nice look. I just have to look at that a little bit more in detail. And there may be a way to do it. Um, and meet the town's current lighting provisions. I, I just haven't had anyone request that type of fixture in a commercial, in a non-residential setting. Well, the whole point of our facility that we're trying to do is to make it more residential. So that would be, you know, that's why we want to go with that type of, you know, gas lights. Yeah. I'd love to see the gas lights. I, I've used gas lights. Now the the we don't we don't have a foot candle minimum in that particular S one, do we? For for parking areas. Well, because, it's the same they're foot. awesome, but they they do not produce a whole lot of light, which is great. No, for, we don't have a foot candle minimum. No, no, that just would be maximum. just on the building. What for the gas? For the gas. Okay, and then the parking lots would be 
following the you know the ordinance for the electric and that's one thing i was trying to recommend in the parking lot you might want to consider like the bell-shaped lights so those mm -hmm. are really classy looking um, you've got some lantern lights on the building which would be nice uh, but maybe in the parking lot instead of the shoebox style uh, fixture head you might want to consider something that has a more decorative look like the acorn or the bell shaped or something it, like it's that gonna be, it's hard it's gonna be tough to i think the gas lanterns are awesome and and i have a source that i've used over the years it's very affordable mm -hmm. uh, and so just wanted to, if if you if you're interested in that you can holler at me at okay. another time and yeah, I, I, I get you that information <laughs> uh, they are they are real expensive here's the but, cost but person <laughs> the uh the uh, my thought is is trying to find something that's going to have enough light you know, let's say in the winter months and it's still dark and you're having that 7 a.m. shift change, which is going to, it's still going to be, it's going to be dark in December and January and February at 7 a.m. You do want some real lighting in the parking lot that's going to give you, you know, make your employees feel a little safer and, and, uh, and so forth. So, but I think I, I kind of agree with what Mark's saying. I think there's some other ways to skin this cat without having to use a big 25 foot tall shoebox fixture. Uh, which we use a lot of, and they produce a lot of light, but it might be something that we really are not going to force you to, to put more light on your site. We'd like, to have, we'd like for you just to have just enough that you feel comfortable at, in the, at nighttime for your employees to, to do their changes or visitors maybe to come over and so forth. But uh, I think there's some other types of lighting that, quite frankly, is probably going to be, a, a, be even more affordable than the 25-foot tall shoebox lights that, um, that you see in most shopping centers and things like that. Uh, I know we do try to use as much LED as we can uh, because of just the longevity, the hours of usage. We don't have to change light bulbs every three weeks. Uh, but we could also match you know, some of the exterior lighting off the building to match the lantern lights. So we want that. And I think Steve did actually a lighting map of the whole site. To, 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 yeah. So is it, you want to speak to that? Well, that may be based upon whatever's proposed, and, and again, you, this may change some. But but again, we're not going to force feed you a minimum foot candle for you to for you to have to require. Obviously, you guys need to determine what's best for your business. But uh, obviously, in this particular scenario, I think less is maybe a little bit better. But the state does require the, the sidewalk egress a certain minimum. Okay. Well, that makes sense. In the event you had a fire alarm go off at 2 a.m., your residents need to feel real comfortable being out on the sidewalk and needs to be lit enough. So uh, we, uh, we we have three pole lights, which is what Mark's talking about, which we use the shoebox in our lighting plan. Um, and uh, we really wanted to use the same fixture that we're using on the front of the building, which is a, a lantern-type style. It doesn't put out as much light, so my, uh, my engineer, uh, so to speak, trumped me on that. Um, uh, I'm not trying to be political, but uh, <laughs> um, has, has he looked at the bell-shaped fixture? Because that is a pretty commonly used yeah, uh, parking lot light for it as an alternative to a shoebox. Well, we'd like to use the lantern style, but it, it's probably going to be about a fourth of the lighting, which may not be an issue because those are on the outer edge of the parking lot. The, the parking lot's against the building where the, the, the egress is is lit otherwise so uh, uh, we may go ahead and go back and use those lantern style lights or if we can find one that puts out more light because you're showing a 20 foot tall pole I think yeah it's so a 20 I'll... foot to top of uh, 20 foot to the top of our light which is what's required yeah well it actually can go to 28 in well I thought I read 20 is fine 20 is yeah. fine yeah 20, 20 is feet better I mean, um, so we you may just have to add more poles if you go with that in yeah. order to get the an adequate light distribution you may have to actually add more poles to your parking lot there's some frosted acorn fixtures as well that would comply yeah. that um yeah but they're not maybe quite as historic as what what mark's talking about but um there, there are definitely some other fixtures that, that you could use that basically the key is is if you can see the the glow of the right. bulb from adjacent right-of-ways or other properties, so the, the, that's how pretty much how we define the glare. So the shoebox fixtures do great of just shining straight down, and when they're real tall, they distribute light over a large area. 
obviously the shorter you go, the smaller the area, the more pole light. So that's, but we're trying to encourage maybe if there's a balance in there to, um, that we, I guess in this scenario, we don't feel like that it has to be lit to a shopping center standard. Right. That you guys, obviously we want you and your, and your employees and your residents to feel safe. That's, that's paramount. But uh, we think there might be some other ways to skin this cat besides just using and traditional shoebox fixtures. I think it's our intention to change that out and to be less uh, equal to or less than what the lumen plan shows, okay. and and use a frosted globe, a frosted glass fixture, uh, really probably to match what we're putting on the front of the building, uh, and have an ornate pole base um, to fit more character. That's our intentions, but. Uh, I don't. Uh, we'll either deal with the staff on that. I, I presume. Or, yeah, I mean, I think lighting is a huge. Is very, very critical. Mm -hmm. uh, on really, especially on that corridor. It's the gateway into the town. Um, and I know there's probably some shoebox lights along that gateway. I'm we sure don't there have, are. Yeah, we don't have any. But no. Uh, what I'd like to see is, you know, anything that is developed through that section, it does have kind of a a decorative look, a maybe almost historic look, um, just a little different look than a commercial or office, typical commercial or office type lighting. Because I think that's it's a kind of seems like a small thing, but it can make such a big visual difference. In well, it that. maintains the re residential feel of yeah. It what gives we're it a residential feel. It's kind of like the traffic islands in Grigsby Chapel. Yeah. They just give it a residential character to that street yeah. by having the landscaping. And, and don't give up on your gas lanterns. I, I, I think with, yeah, some, we, with some research, I think staff can we, get comfortable that the a gas lantern does not have it. it doesn't even it doesn't really even have a, a glare. There's just a flicker. Yeah, that's so. that's part of the charm of it. Is and we would we would prefer not to frost the glass. Because I you understand. want to see those lights flickering. Right. Gas lanterns. It would look funny. To, you're wasting yeah. your money to yeah, frost some yeah. gas lanterns. Yeah, I wouldn't frost that. Yeah, I'd defeat the purpose of it. I'll just have to look at it. Um, I am familiar with what those look like, and they they are very attractive. Does anybody else have any questions or comments at this time? Do you have any major problems or you, you all in agreement with all the uh, subject twos here that you can work with? As long as he can make it happen. Yeah. Good <laughs> 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 <Good> man. <laughs> no, we do not have any objections. Uh, we'll work with the staff and work through all of those and make sure they happen. Okay, great. Great, and, and you're going to be happy. <laughs> Don't put that in a minute. <laughs> so they'll be back in a couple of months for the walking trail and bridge. So, you know, if if you need to revisit the lighting as well, again, at that time, we could certainly do that. But you need to, it, you know, if you're going to go with the decorative lights, you need to show that, include those on your next okay. submittal. And that's what we would assume you're going to go with. So have somebody that wanted to speak to this yeah we do have okay. one speaker uh, Carol Christopherson so. Carol Christopherson 11320 Gates Mill Drive uh, 37934. I am very heartened by what I hear tonight. Uh, the attention to detail, the quality of the materials I'm gathering is quite good. Uh, the only question I had, and I had mentioned this to Peter a long time ago, was keeping the building as low as possible to uh, not have a massive feel to it, which I don't think it will. But I was wondering how high, what's the h maximum height of that cupola? Oh, the, I'm not sure about that. No, Steve could probably address that. Uh, we did condition the rezoning on a 25-foot right. height um, from the average grade along Campbell Station Road to the midpoint of the roof line. That that doesn't count the the uh, iconic element okay does that i mean i it looks like it's 30 feet i'm 
eyeballing it. Is that what it is? The fair to Steve on that. I'm not. I don't remember exactly. And what again, it was. I, and I'm not an architect. And if lowering that to just kind of keep the whole feel down a little bit is going to ruin the roof line, okay. But I just anything that you can do to just keep the building looking very comfortably residential would be very helpful. That's my only comment. What he was trying to do there was address the requirement in our design standards for an iconic element. So that's why he, he has that on there and in that kind of the front. The top image is what you'd see from Heron Road. That's the front entrance of the building. And then the second image is the Campbell Station elevation. Um, so that's going to be your two most visible elevations. Okay, again, I'm not an architect. I just want to make sure that we do everything we can to keep that looking low. Thank you. I'm very excited about this. Have any? Anybody else have any questions or comments? Planning Commission, have any more questions? The applicant brought some samples. And so we're kind of at the point where we probably need to just, it'd be nice to kind of go through, and we appreciate you bringing your samples versus just renderings. It, it helps a ton. Uh, would you mind sharing with us your, your thoughts on kind of the horizontal breaks between the brick and the stone and the, the hardy? Palette dollars. More earth than that. No. Uh, no. Uh, no. And then we have uh, our <laughs> the heavy timber roof, which is uh, uh, a brownish uh, stain, but the, the uh, uh, rendering colors show it a lot better than it is. It's a uh, little brown. So is that is that basically like a freeze board? You're using it up in the gables. You're going to use a stained material. Yeah, we uh, and our our, our uh, shear mm -hmm. and our columns on the porches. The top portions are are wood, stained wood, and then the beams and the uh, fascia <coughs> are uh, uh, stained wood. Uh, and then we have. Uh, just a little bit of copper uh, here and there. Well, like maybe some of those little eyebrows, a couple of those, yeah, like the eyebrows on the porte cachet. Porte cachet, and then on the Campbell Station side, the element that comes further out. So we have a little mm -hmm. section that comes out further, and we have copper on that. A little kind of shed, little shed area off the side, yeah.
cuts down. That's the same as the Starts out as brick and then they, it transitions to stone. Okay. So that's what he's talking about is the organic transition. Yeah. Instead of being a straight horizontal line, uh, um, it's going to be uh, organic. Is the best way I can describe it. On the finishes page, there's an example. It's not the right colors, but there's an example of how it's kind of right. I like it. I think you guys have done a great job of trying to find something that's that's real compatible with the with the immediate neighborhood and kind of low profile, but yet really elegant and classy. Thank you. And from the yeah, it's a little bit difficult to budget because of the cost of this is not anything like anything we built, so this is much nicer. So I'm just taking a stab in the dark at how much money to borrow. <laughs> Well, you're going to have a nice end product. It's yeah, going to be a, a really nice. I don't want to live there. <laughs> well, one aspect that I <laughs> one aspect that I like is the fact that it is more homey looking, and I know that's important when when somebody is in a facility, and it, it is it does have a homier look to it. Yeah. When do you guys Which plan is on worth, worth something to residents and their families? When do you guys plan on finishing? What is your target date? Steve? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think he needs 60 more days for the plans. Uh, or more. Yeah. Or more. He keeps saying more. I'm giving him 60 days for the plans. Uh, Richard's got to file some engineering TDAC things. I don't know how long that's going to take. Richard, three, three weeks. We hope we would break ground in 60 days, yeah. uh, maybe 90. Yeah, we've got to get the so. uh, It takes 30 days for the state to approve, mm. uh, but we can start moving dirt. So yeah. I'm, I'm going to try to time it where when we submit the plans to the state, I'll release the excavation. So the excavation we start, the plans will be approved by the state, so there's not a big dirt field out there for very long. Hopefully not at all. It'll be approved before it's ready to keep rolling, and then it's uh, scheduled for a 12-month construction. Okay. So possibly um, October, September, October of next that year. Your, your state permitting, you're not necessarily talking about TDEC anymore. You're talking about like certificate of need? Uh, it's the well, health department. Health department, okay. health department, and they're basically life safety uh, inspections, uh, all the fire ratings, Fire codes, Just because, because it's an assisted that, living or it is licensed by the state for okay. annual inspections and so they are concerned about the safety of our residents. Is assisted living the correct nomenclature or is, is this more it is assisted okay. living because we hear all these things like senior living, independent living, nursing care and correct. so we're I, they all kind of run together to me, and I'm, I know they have to do with different types of care, but I'm still not quite sure which is which. So you're, this is called assisted living. It is okay. That means that if you if you need a shot, you have somebody there to give somebody a shot. Uh, okay, and that's the difference between independent living and senior or assisted it's, living. It's being muddy. Waters are being muddy. Uh, the places like uh, Parkview and Cheryl Hills are providing some medical care, but on a private duty basis. Uh, so the state is actually hmm. kind of looking at some of the unlicensed type of facilities. Right. Kind of encroaching on this level of care without any oversight. So there's, but that's that's an industry issue that's happening. Any more questions or comments? I have a motion. I have to approve the site plan with uh, all the subject twos. All second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you and good luck. Thank you, committee. You got it. It's been a long time getting here. You're, yeah. you, you've made big progress tonight. <laughs> and we have it in the records that she has to be satisfied. <laughs> <laughs> I had a, a 
Item number 10, discussion in public hearing on a tax amendment to the Farragut Zoning Ordinance, Chapter 3, <laughs> Section 9. Attach single family residential district. Nah, I'm done. All right, folks, we have a couple more items, so we're going to yeah. get out of here tonight. So if we could yes. get get rolling. Appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. You're all moving out in the, in the lobby, please. <laughs> Thank you. Discussion in public hearing on a tax amendment to the Farragut Zoning Ordinance, Chapter 3, Section 9. Attach single-family residential development, R-4, subsection D.1.B, to amend the front yard setback provisions when parking garages are located are rear loaded. Benchmark Associates Incorporated applicant. Okay, I, let me just give you an overview of what we're doing, what the request is. Um, the R4 zoning district is our attached single family, I guess loosely referred to as condo. That could also be detached, but this is for attached single family. Um, the uh, And it has very very different setback provisions than what you would have for single family detached like briar like uh, sheffield that we looked at earlier um, one of the <clears throat> objectives of the r4 district is to provide for some flexibility in garage placement because in these kind of developments you can have uh, um, quite a few units that are closely spaced like in that upper diagram there um, and that can lead to a lot of closely spaced driveways uh, if you have front entry uh, garages. So the R4 provides uh, for the opportunity to be able to move the building up closer to the street if you have like a, a rear entry or an alley enter, entry uh, garage. Um, and um, that's what that diagram illustrates. The two units on the end have kind of a, a alley or rear entry uh, situation whereas the middle ones have a traditional front entry um, to try to you know make the streetscape more visually appealing so you're not looking at a bunch of driveways and garage doors um, uh, so that's a good provision uh, it's some a flexible provision that's in our r4 district uh, that you all worked on uh, many years ago um, what the request is at this time is to Kind of build on that and expand that flexibility to provide for in the case of those units that have a rear loaded garage um, like what you see on the screen the ability to have um, an extended covered porch overhang that could come out closer to the street so that that structure from the applicant's perspective is has an opportunity to uh, soften and engage uh, the public realm um, a little bit more. Um, in the case of uh, what's on the screen, you can see that the steps come down almost to the sidewalk and you've got an extended covered porch um, area that's closer to the street. Uh, that has a kind of a way of softening a street in some cases. Uh, the front porch, you know, if you go to old downtowns, these houses that are up closer to the street uh, the front porch was traditionally uh, a neighborhood building kind of uh, you know aspect of a of a house it was a place where people gathered and interacted with other people um, so from the staff's perspective if you're trying to provide for language in your ordinance that can encourage that i think it's a positive thing um, so what the specifically they're requesting is to be able to have just the covered porch overhang come out to within 10 feet of the uh, street. Currently, um, the building has to be 15 feet from the street, and that's not changing. It's just the overhang that would be able to come out closer. Um, where you have an overhang that's more than two feet from the building foundation, you measure the setback from the end of the overhang. Mm -hmm. So that's why uh, this is uh, 
being requested uh, at this time that would not be allowed under the current uh, language of the ordinance. So, uh, in your at your places is resolution PC 16-16, which does recommend approval uh, of ordinance 16-20, and basically that ordinance, in addition to providing for the opportunity to bring a covered porch overhang to within 10 feet, it also stipulates that it that encroachment cannot be within the public right of way, nor can it interfere with landscaping along the streetscape or pedestrian facilities, which we might want to talk about in relation to what's on the screen in that regard. Um, and nor can it, it, it conflict with uh, utilities. So, you know, you, those things are to be looked at on the front end when somebody's wanting to build a structure like that. And really, you need to look at the surrounding context, I think, as, as well, and make sure that that it fits in, it's not uh, out of character with what's around it. Um, in the case of this particular structure, you know, uh, I would suggest that they have a, a landing area instead of the steps coming out right to the sidewalk, that you have at least a three foot deep landing area uh, before those, those steps uh, come out so that there's some separation between uh, you know the steps and the the public sidewalk to give it a little bit of of separation rather than just total engagement there. But um, anyway, that's that's what is being requested. And um, benchmark survey and Benny Mormon is here. If you have any specific questions, uh, he or I can try to help answer those. The public right of way ends at the sidewalk. Is that correct? Uh, in the case of that one, uh, Benny, you probably could, it's, it's, uh, It's right at, real close to the sidewalk. Edge of the sidewalk, it's pretty, mm -hmm. yeah. And that's 15 feet from the dwelling unit, which is a, not, doesn't include the porch. Actually, the porch itself is 15 feet from the, a little more from the back of curb, which is where the setbacks are measured from in the R4 zoning. It says street, but that's the way we've treated it, yeah. Yeah. Could you tell us who you are and give us a Benny address? Mormon with Benchmark Associates, 10308 Hardin Valley Road. I'm, Mark's done a great job with uh, pulling this together for, I think it's very clearly written, and I'm here simply to answer questions. I think my struggle is what you mentioned about the steps coming right up to the sidewalk. But when I drove that neighborhood um, yesterday, there's a few houses that already exist that do that, that enter right onto the sidewalk. Yeah. So if we put that into our um, ordinance, does that mean basically those houses are grandfathered in? They're not? Yeah, yeah. right, right, right. Okay. But if we have a landing area, doesn't that mean the steps are going to be steep? Well, yeah. I mean, that, that would change that. And it, 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 it would still have to be built to code. It would force the house back on the lot further, which we're, we're on, that house is on the setbacks almost all the way around. Yeah, it's real tight. It's just a thought. I, uh, yeah. I well, you could conceivably bring, bring a landing down and then bring them off to the side. Um, that's a, an option in that location. Oh. I guess it was something that I was looking at and thinking, um, if you're walking, if people are walking three and then you come to those steps, it kind of interferes with uh, anybody walking on that street because it comes right to the sidewalk. That was something I was thinking of. Um, it does give a, a um, you see that a lot in more urban areas. They feed right onto the sidewalk. So I was thinking that a, a little bit of a, um, even just a little bit of a walkway from it kind of softens that a little bit. Um, I'm not sure if it's worth getting hung up over. Uh, what? Because I think that neighborhood is so beautiful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is a beautiful it's neighborhood. One of the there. downsides to uh, right. trying to feather to the sides that would create that is you would lose a lot of landscaping. I have a question about uh, liability of the homeowner. Um, is there any liability of the homeowner if they if 
their steps come right down to the sidewalk there. Is that an issue anywhere? With, have you ever come across anything like that? I personally have not, uh, no. Uh, um, I'm always afraid I'm going to get sued. Uh, somebody trips over my steps or something. Um, yeah, but you could trip over the mailbox. You could trip over yeah. the... I mean, you could trip over anything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, so... I know, I <laughs> I will say this also, I mean, this is the potential to be next to what we consider our downtown district, yeah. which will True. have more of a downtown feel to begin with. So, um, well, and as this neighborhood is, this, you know, kind of when I look at it, it's modeled after Charleston style homes. Mm -hmm. But that other that you're speaking about, I think you're going to see a lot more use of of. Um, Craftsman-style homes, which would also implement this type of architectural design. So it's real. I think you're being forward-thinking <laughs> to consider it. Any other questions or comments? I don't really have an issue with the the overhang of the porch. I, I really don't. Um, as long as the building setbacks are are maintained, um, the porch coming out it gives it. Because not all of them are going to do that. It gives it some character. It gives it some visual interest as you're walking down the road. Was, although one concern I have, if you've got two or three of those in a row, what does that look like? It gets crowded, yeah. So that's my concern. Mm -hmm. Then you're starting to feel a little bit, um, yeah, tent in. Mm -hmm. But that's... Should there be some language in there that talks about the mm -hmm. surrounding context? Here yeah, we go again. I know. Yeah. <laughs> but really, it kind of needs to be looked at com more comprehensively instead of just an individual or an afterthought because it can affect, especially with these type of developments, you don't want somebody doing something that is very different from what's around it, although you want some different, but you don't want it to... Be so cutter. different yeah. that it creates, or it encourages, like you said, three or four like that in yeah. a row, and then it kind of looks, and you know, out of place a little bit. It, it doesn't loses really, its attractiveness and its interest. Yeah, the variation in kind of is the good thing about it. I think is, and that's all I was talking about in the ordinance was just to give somebody that opportunity if they wanted to do that. All right, so let me ask you this. If we put that in the ordinance that we don't want to see that, however that language is, at what point do you determine, okay, you can't build that house with that porch? Is that the building permit tells you what house you're getting and what kind of porch you're getting? How, what's that procedure like? Well, that's a good question. I mean, it, it would go through the codes <laughs> department, and that, that porch would be in the design, and if staff see something that they're uncomfortable with, they could bring it back to planning commission and, and – uh, and let us take a look at it. I mean, that's kind of how we've kind of dealt with stuff like that when you start dealing with ambiguous situations, especially when we talk about context. The context is somewhat difficult to define, as we all know. We worked on the last couple of months. But, uh, I mean, I think that's something that if, if there's a red flag that pops up, staff could, could ask us to take a look at it. Mark, you mentioned adding language along the lines of maybe no more than two adjoining lots. In, in that zoning could have that feature. That would keep you from having them stack up. I, having, it, having a series of rows. Well, I agree. It, I, this is a little bit burdensome for the staff to try to enforce because you're, yeah. I mean, the last thing we want is every time there's a building permit request, the staff has to go out into the field and look at the next door neighbor's house. Yeah. yeah. So we kind of need to avoid that. Quite frankly, I can't really see this happening again. Um, there's a little bit of history behind this particular one. I think it's completely appropriate, and I support what we're doing tonight. But I, you know, it's an expensive way to build a porch. It, uh, you know, when you have a lot of sun exposure, it'd be a great way to create the shade and so forth. But I can't really see this being very prolific, prolific in the town, um, especially being that we don't really have a lot of R4 that um, that we deal with. But nevertheless, if we wanted to put some language in there that would make it pretty cut and dry and black and white for the staff, uh, I think that's great. But again, we don't necessarily want to have to force the staff to have to go think about context every time. And remember what we did back in 2016 and we had that R4 thing and is that the neighborhood we need to go look at? So I'm kind of open-minded with this. I'm not really worried about it happening again. But um, but nevertheless, especially being that we're maintaining the 15-foot if front setback, if we were changing the 15-foot front setback, there's a whole other barrel of monkeys that we'd have to deal with 
that, uh, but we're not. We're just dealing with the roof overhang, and I think staff has addressed the uh, the issues that has to do with maybe some street trees that could be um, encroached and things like that, or utilities. But um, is the language clear to you all that we're not talking about the building found the main building wall? We're only talking about the roof overhang, a covered overhang. porch yeah. overhang. Yeah. Is that yeah. real clear? I okay. think that's very clear. All right, I just wanted because that's what we are talking about. We don't want it to mean that you can bring the whole building up right. ten feet. Yeah, the, the footprint of the building is still going to stay the same. Yeah. I should say the foundation footprint is going to stay the same. So, any more questions or comments? Just want to go with the wording as is. Is that what? Okay. Mm -hmm. Do I have a motion? I'll make a stab at it. I'm going to make a motion to approve resolution PC-16-16, which then recommends approval of ordinance 16-20 to the board of mayor and alderman. Second. Those in favor, aye. Aye. Opposed? Moving thank, on to thank you very much. our next to the last issue. Uh, discussion of intersection improvements of US 1170 Kingston Pike and Watt Road. This is uh, for discussion purposes only. We do not vote on this. Is that right, Mark? That is correct. Uh, okay. <laughs> or Daryl. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. I'm Daryl Smith. I'm the town engineer. For those of you that don't know me, I, I think I've met everyone except maybe the gentleman on the end. Congratulations on your appointment. Thank you. So, This is a discussion of a project that we have been looking at for uh, three or four years now, actually. Uh, it's been on our, our CIP for a couple of years, and it's, uh, it's grown a little bit in, in scope. Uh, it's kind of hard to tell from the the drawing that is on the overhead there, if you look, the north arrow is to the right of the page, so it throws you off a little bit. That is Kingston Pike at Watt Road. Watt Road is to the north is to the right. Uh, somehow that, that throws me off the more I look at it. it uh, sorry, I, I, have to look I don't know things. if it's doing that to you guys, but it does to me. <coughs> Lower right corner. No, as, as, uh, as we were getting ready to extend Watt Road south of Kingston Pike, to Old Stage Road a few years ago, it occurred to us we have kind of a dilemma there. Uh, Watt Road, when it was rebuilt back in 1981, was a T intersection at Kingston Pike. I'm sure some of you remember that. Uh, there was, uh, I guess, Little Joe's Pizza was the only thing that was on the, the south side of Kingston Pike there. Uh, later on, Watt Road was extended back to the Isarium, and we kind of reconfigured the intersection, but without a heavy through movement. We still allowed the, the through movement was required to go into the center turn lane to go across Kingston Pike. If you're familiar with it and you know where you're going, that's really not any big deal. But if you're unfamiliar with it, it's a little odd. If you're headed from the interstate, you're, as you approach Kingston Pike and you want to make the through movement, you have to get into the center turn lane. That's, that's not really right. Uh, and, and it does throw people off a bit. So the idea is to reassign the lanes. Uh, the more we've looked at it, the more the project has grown. Uh, there are islands. If you look on the north side of Kingston Pike, the radius returns are very wide, very, uh, I don't know, they're about 75-foot radius returns. Uh, we want to put pedestrian crossings there. That makes a very long pedestrian crossing. So we want to tighten up the radius returns, actually add a right turn lane, southbound right turn. To, if you're turning to go west on Kingston Pike toward Lenore City, and, uh, and provide a sidewalk uh, extension from the intersection up to the rural metro building where there's sidewalk now. now this is a, actually a very important pedestrian uh, facility because this would connect sidewalk from Old Stage Road, McPhee Road, and points beyond all the way to Mayor Bob Leonard Park. So uh, this is something that we were going to do under our own uh, CIP and we've budgeted for it and we've presented it to you in the past but just in kind of in passing and presenting the CIP. Uh, last year we did approached TDOT about using spot safety money, uh, requested that, that they contribute on this, and 
TDOT agreed to fund roughly half of the construction cost, uh, plus oversee the construction. Makes my job a lot nice. easier. So, uh, hey, it's a win for all of us. Right now we're looking at, uh, we, we're trying to incorporate this into a resurfacing project that will happen in late 2017, uh, or at least fiscal year 2017, by TDOT. It's not likely to hit it at the same time, but that's kind of what we're shooting for. But uh, we're we're hoping that uh, this will go to construction sometime next calendar year. So anyway, I just want to present that to you guys for your input, for the the public's input. I think our public has left us. <laughs> but uh, uh, do you have any questions or comments? This has absolutely nothing to do with the uh, split down there. Is that correct? Has nothing to do with the split. Uh, completely separate project. When does that happen? Uh, I, they're buying right of way right now. And I spoke with Danny Oliver at TDOT the other day, and uh, they're looking at pushing, in order to uh, allow First Utility District more time to, uh, to budget their relocations, they're looking at pushing this to about October of next year. So right. No, <laughs> this one would probably get. Uh, oh well, get done at the same time. Yeah, this one could start at about the same time. Might be done a little bit before that. That's okay. a much bigger project. Okay. I think. We have, I'm sorry. Sidewalks on, along each side of these where these roads are getting repaved and repaved. Yes, uh, one thing, there is no sidewalk on Kingston Pike on the south side in front of Little Joe's Pizza or the Dixie Lee Liquor Store. Mm -hmm. What we're proposing right now, uh, and, and this is going to require TDOT's approval, is to, right now on that south side there is about a, about a nine or ten foot shoulder over to the curb. Uh, it's, it's really not a useful shoulder. People kind of use it as a decel lane if they're turning in to Watt Road, but it's not really wide enough for that. I would rather they not use it at all. We want to use that space, add sidewalk and curb and gutter, and leave the green space that's out in front of Little Joe's and the Dixie Lou liquor stores alone. So hopefully we can get all that in and, uh, and be able to extend sidewalks really on all four quadrants great is we're getting rid of that funny little slip ramp that occurs at that that um that northwest corner the funny little slip ramp going south and going west you've got a little island that's stuck yes, out there in the intersection there are those slip ramps as you know is for pedestrians are so dangerous there they are and uh well they also don't have uh handicap ramps and uh uh they provide kind of a uh to to approaching motorists they feel like they have more of a free movement and they yeah, and, and they, I mean, they'll they just, tend they to hit it with, put it on two wheels as they go around. They do. So I know, I think changing the the radius and do, doing th these improvements are, are great improvements. So Great. So wherever we see black, that's where all the new paving is going to happen? That's correct. Okay. Um, does, is, remind me, is Watt Road, it's a double, is it a single lane road each way? Um, uh, it's it's three, it's three lanes. It's three lanes. Okay. Uh, through that whole section, if you're well, if you're approaching from the interstate, you'll have with this project a left turn lane, a through lane, and a right turn lane. Okay. So it kind of opens up some. And where does the where it's it's red up there, um, the north part? That's where it becomes a turning lane for both of them. Is that? Oh, uh, that that's correct. Okay. Will this require new signals at this? Yes, uh, there will be signal modifications. There, there are, for some reason, they put uh, mast arm poles in those islands, or at least one of the islands, and it's going to have to be replaced. I think we're going to be replacing at least two of the poles. If, if we get an opportunity and it's, it's financially feasible, if we could update those with our new black poles, obviously yes. it looked funny to do two, two black and two anodized. Well, we may have to paint one if it's left in place. Uh, and and replace the other two with the powder coated black. Okay. And maybe even add the uh, uh, decorative bases. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've seen those oh, kind yeah. of the fluted. They look good. They look great. Nice. The stoplights are. 
allowed a bicyclist to go through. <laughs> We're working on that. <laughs> so does anybody else have any questions for Daryl on, on this project? I will say this. I always appreciate just about every meeting I have a new phrase added to my lexicon. Usually Noah does it. It's, <laughs> now it's slip ramps and adding that to the back I of my mind. I just looked it up. I didn't know yeah. what it was. So I always very. I think that's that one of the, the reasons why I love coming to these meetings. Well, kind of like an uncontrolled right turn. That's is out what of I control said. right turn. Or uncontrolled is kind of that funny. <laughs> yeah, I think that's used so correctly. The slip ramp because you've got this funny with it right now. It's protected by a little island, but it's they're real dangerous. It's a slip. It's a well, a, a slip ramp really is a term used for when you get off the interstate and you just pull into an adjacent you don't have to stop you just pull into a that's kind of much how they're using that parallel. right turn well now. they kind of use it that way right there yeah, <laughs> you got, yeah. You've got your own little right lane that turns right and uh, goes westbound but it um I've, i drive that a lot watt road and kingston pike so uh, these are great improvements we appreciate you working on it and well, and well, getting some, somebody else's money to pay for half of it so right. that's what i, was I guess it's our money it's just it's not our county yeah well, there, there there were a lot of those built back in the 80s that uh uh the idea was to improve the the intersections to give wide radius returns so that vehicles had a freer movement. Well, they take a freer movement if you provide that. Um, so now everybody is tightening them back back up in order to allow pedestrians to cross without being killed. That's always a good objective. <laughs> we appreciate, uh, uh, like Noah said, we appreciate the fact that you are always able to come up with money through grants and um, always looking for cash always That's looking so we appreciate that <laughs> yeah somebody's gonna get it might as well be us yeah we appreciate Thank that you, Darryl. The, all right. the engineering department and the all of the town of Farragut does a great job with that so we uh, Thank you. benefit greatly from it um, any public hearing on uh, proposed new, no. new utilities at that time no no new utilities so the July 21st, 2016 meeting is adjourned. Yay. And you had a short one, too. Yeah. Yeah. This was on your